I thought you were all done with the caps. How many more do you have to go? It's going out of fabric. So I have to have like, like 10. 80 more cut out. About 10? This is maybe half of them. So like 10? You'll have them done by tomorrow? No more. I have like 80 more cut out. That's too many. It's, it's not, <laughs> apparently. That's too many. Considering I'm still getting messages. That was two nurses messaged me today. So I have most of the units. You already got mission, I right? I did, but okay. they might need more after this. Oh, we'll see. But I have, yes, I have given them to mission as well. They don't have very many nurses out there comparatively. Right. It's well, it's a small tiny, hospital. It's tiny hospital. Uh-huh. Tiny. The ER waiting room <sighs> is smaller than our living room. I know, because I've been there. All right. Let us continue. There is shock throughout the Varia. Sabal feels like a total failure. The Guardian had been behind him. He had no way to know how long they were there, but he knew now that he was a complete joke to even his own crew. If he were too upset to think this through before that event, he is livid now. Altillians are supposed to be superior in every way. There had been writings throughout their history regarding their place at the top of any evolutionary chain one might put together. There had always been speculation that life within the Milky Way had originated in two spots within the galaxy. The seeding process for humanoid planets <clears throat> had been the same on Conley, Falteris, and Earth, though Conley had been seeded first. Altel and Altair had been seeded from the same spot, which was likely the reason that world hadn't been eliminated as Conley had, had been during Geyer and Gore's collective reign of terror. Uh, the galaxy was tough enough to reign in as it had been before, now, as Sabelle considers what he is part of here, it seems to be too complicated for one Altillion to run the show. Time travel had always seemed like cheating to Sabelle. He knew that it, that if they didn't use it to their advantage, that this would allow their enemies to do so instead. It just made everything seem too much for, to him. We need to do something here, Rex says, to snap his commander out of his daze. What do we do? We don't know how to time travel, which is clearly what they did, Sabelle says. That's not pins, right? It sure is. Oh, joy. Keep reading. Yay. Would you like some magnets to help pick I up the pins? Magnet. Is it a uh huh. Okay. See, ta da. Because one of those could go through my foot and kill me. You realize that? You're very well. Your foot's special, then, isn't it? My foot is special. Thank you for noticing. All right. Magnet. Wreck actually smiles. There's there's more over there, I think. I see the beauty of this, Commander. You see the Guardian, Vindicator, uh-huh, and E215 have all left our time and moved into another time. That leaves Earth and Falteris both very vulnerable. Falteris is reeling from the death of Talia Laris. They have a divided population, and this might be the best time to deal with them. Earth will always be weak, so once we have Falteris under our power, the Earth follows soon after. They would give up, he explains. Sabal pauses to think this over. I can mobilize, but they'll likely know what we're doing. There won't be much of a surprise to the attack. Well, what does it matter if they can't muster a defense to stop us? Rex asks as a smile crosses his face. You've been seeking a moment in your reign as commander which will define you, and this is it. This moment is the one that will define you as the rightful commander of our world, the Altillion meant to lead our military to ultimate victory. Burn Jernon to the ground and stand victorious among them. Do this and make the galaxy fear us once again. Sabal looks over his navigation officer. Set a course for Falteris. Then he turns to the communications officer. Let her fleet know that the time has come. We're going to burn Falteris to the ground. Next scene. Sarias Laris sits down in the room that had been her sister's. Frank rightly is there and he is still shaking visibly, shaking visibly from what had, been, what had happened. I've told you, Frank, that you being there wouldn't have done anything except lead to your death as well. I was charged with watching her. First, I failed my brother, and now I failed the leader of this planet. I really should just retire and head to some hole in the wall somewhere, Frank says, slumping down in a chair near a window that overlooks the city. Frank, this is a very dangerous time for our people. We have rebels who may very well storm the city. With both the Vindicator and Guardian off in the future... God, that sounds weird. But with them off in the future, that leaves us a little exposed, Shariah says as she makes her way over to the window and places a hand on Frank's shoulder. You think they'll know? Frank asks. 
Look, someone killed my sister today. The planet's government's in chaos. Rebels took that shot and word got around. I honestly feel we have spies among us who will share any information they have with the Altillians. So if they're in the dark, they won't be for long. We have to be ready, she says. She then goes to a control panel on her desk and calls up one of the senior officers in the military, Colonel Max Cameron. Shrius Laris, to what do I owe the honor, he asks with a raised eyebrow. Max, this is a business call. I need you to take to take us to a ready state. I feel the Altillians will make their move now if they're going to make it at all. Send patrols out and have our ships ready for battle. We have the complement of 500 KG-329 fighters, and I want them in orbit as soon as possible. I also want to put a call out to Temp and any of our forces there on training missions. Anyone training near Temp is just a rookie, Shirais. They're not going to be battle ready, Max protests. I'm giving the orders, Colonel Cameron. We need everyone here or we may not have much left to fight for. You got that? Max looks down for a moment and nods. Yes, ma'am, it'll be done, he says, and Shirai sends the call there. She then uses the control panel to make another call, one which transmits to Earth across a wormhole set up for communication purposes. It's microscopic in its size, but right now its importance is large. It's an unusual step for a call to be made in this manner, and Shirai is going straight to the top as Allison Hannon answers on the other end. Shirias, it's good to see you. My condolences on the loss of your sister. I appreciate the thought, but this is a business call, Shirias says. I fear that our enemies will see, will see weakness in my world right now with the death of Talia. As much as I want to mourn her passing properly, I feel it would be foolish and could lead to our defeat at the hands of the Altillian Armada. I need to know your fleet's ready to go. Allison nods. I actually put her defenses on high alert when I heard about Talia. Knowing what's going on with some of our best ships... Being all over the galaxy makes us vulnerable as well. I've called back any forces we've sent to Jupiter or Mars. The Peace Restorer is staffed and ready to fight if need be. This is a very dangerous time for us both. They could target Earth as easily as they could target your world. I hope I won't need to send a distress signal your way, but I feel better knowing uh, you have the same feeling I do regarding this chain of events, Shariah says with a nod before ending the call. She then looks over at Frank. Now, you need to stop feeling sorry for yourself. I need a commander for a warship, and you're the man for the job. Are you kidding me? Frank asks, his eyes wide. I failed at everything I've done. I'm the last man you'd want to give a chance like this. Fighting's for the young, and I never felt so old and useless. You have experience, Frank. I need people with experience. My sister didn't die, so our planet would be conquered by those guys. It's not going to happen on my watch, Shariah Shur says. Our parliament hasn't even given the green light for you to be making decisions like this. You could receive a strong, strong backlash to these actions, Frank cautions her. I'm willing to risk that. I'm not willing to risk our world falling to the Altillians. If that's something you can live with, go home and I'll find someone else to do the job in your place. Frank looks Shirias in the eyes. Yeah, no, I'll do it. I have a debt to pay to them. They made Kale look like a fool for a very long time. My family's legacy is one of shame and I can make amends for that. I just wanted you to know how I've been feeling. Duly noted. Now go to the Inferno and report for duty. The ship's named after fire? Frank asks. Isn't that tempting fate? What's in a name, she asks. Every ship we have flies and every man and woman willing to fight gets the chance. That might be our only chance, Colonel, Colonel Rightly. Can you just name me to a rank like that? Yep, I just did. Shut up and go. Every moment we spend talking, Sabelle could be closer to his end goal and we get attacked before we're fully ready. She says and then quickly leaves the room. She looks up. If there's an afterlife, I have to make my sister proud. That's the end of that chapter. So yeah, the Infernal. That's a great name for a warship, right? It's really not. So. Because as soon as that goes down, just imagine how that reads. Yeah. All right. This okay. It makes so it easier for people writing articles to make up clever headlines. Oh yeah. Though. Yeah. Yeah. I don't even know why you'd name it that. I just thought it was funny at the time because I'm like, I, I don't know. I need new need another ship name. I'll go in, Inferno. I know they have to be one word names. Yeah. They have to be punchy. So I'm like, ah, Inferno. <laughs> Chapter nine. This is where Geyer had to make a stand. Being threatened and humiliated by his son was only part of his larger problem. His immortality was currently in danger, and he had enemies conspiring to undo everything he'd worked so hard to achieve. This future had been cultivated by him and his whims. He's the master and no one can stand in his way. In his research regarding the war after his e exit from the past, the name that keeps coming up is Mike Translow. Mike had been a catalyst for his people and becomes a martyr upon his disappearance. His family name remained prominent throughout the galaxy after his passing, the same as had been the case with the Websters. The fact that two of the Webster brothers from the past are here now is seen as an opportunity. 
It's all new for Gora. He had not traveled through time as many times as his father had. He knew uh, there were rules to this, but his father was blinded by his arrogance to those rules. Gora had discussed this at length with Dizak, a respected young man on, on Altil, who had a lot of grand scientific theories. Gora had been interested in the time travel possibilities, but he left the details to his father, and he was regretting that now. The fight he had with Geyer left Gora torn. He wanted to stand on his own, but his father still scares him. He knows this is only a clone of his real father, that his real father's dead, but it's difficult to maintain any kind of rebellious urge with this figure around, his real father or not. He's also aware that, his clone, that this clone is unstable and psychotic, though these are attributes which are commonly known to have uh, large portions, take up large portions of his original father's personality as well. In terms of Geyer's state of mind regarding Gora, he's perfectly fine with killing his son right here and now, but he feels he needs him. Gora could be useful when they go into battle with their enemies. Gora could have information regarding the men and women on those ships and about those ships themselves as well. He may kill Gora once the battle's finished for his mutinous behavior. The crew is understandably tense on Geyer's ship. They're used to being somewhat on the outside of things, their careers on hold while Geyer chose to chose when to return to the past and take over the galaxy. There were rumors running throughout the ship that about what may or may not happen from here on, thanks to Geyer remaining somewhat tight-lipped with the majority of the crew. With the knowledge that so many of his enemies from the past are here in the future, Gora wants the fight to happen right now. Word of a fight near Earth which saw the destruction of an Altillion warship means that a ship was in the wrong place at the wrong time. Earth didn't have a ship capable of putting up such a fight and ultimately surviving. This is a situation which frustrates Geyer, as he likes to be seen as the one in control at all times. He'd worked extensively on mind control techniques, and had overseen some experiments in his time on controlling the will of others. He has worked hard to develop a fleet that will work as a unit, and the one that will do as, as he says without question. As much control as he may have had with his own kind, he has no control over the enemy, and thought that he had. Uh, the survival of Addison Marks has been troubling for him. He had taken pride in the complete annihilation of Conley's people, and here was Addison as a lone survivor of a dead world. He had also believed that humans were all weak, and the fact that some had been able to resist an illness let loose on the human population seemed to suggest otherwise. As Geyer stands, his son at his side, the two of them staring at the vastness of space before them, there's a decision to be made. Do we have a status update? Geyer asks one of his officers. Sir, we believe that the ships in question have been spotted near Temp. What are we to do? He asks. Geyer pauses and looks over at his son for a moment before he answers. We'd be foolish not to attack. Alert the fleet. It's time for war, he says with a twisted smile crossing his face. Next scene. The Vindicator's still docked with the E-215 when Mike shakes hands with John. Words already reached them regarding the fight near Earth. They're aware... This has to be an ally, and the destruction of an Altillion warship will likely lead to an escalation in the struggle. Though the Vindicator is invisible to radar, this is not a feature the E-215 has. The decision was a simple one, to have E-215 separate from the Vindicator and prepare for the likely fight ahead. The Vindicator would do its best to shield E-215 when the fighting starts, and they're sure it's going to happen. I'll see you again soon, Mike vows to the commander of E-215. I'm glad we finally have a chance to win this war instead of sitting around and waiting for them to come to us. If we win this, we finally get our chance to avenge the deaths of so many, John says as he turns to exit the Vindicator. You're sure you don't want to just stay here and take the fight to them in this ship, Mike asks, aware that his ship is much stronger than the 215. I have a good crew and we know how to fight, that, fight their fleet. Their arrogance is their weakness, John says with a wink towards Mike. He then exits the ship and the door between the two craft closes. Mike turns and makes his way down the hallway to his quarters. He intends to get uh, changed prior to his flight and walks into the quarters to find himself sitting there. This causes him to jump and actually reach for his gun. Are the enemy going to replace him with an evil twin for this battle? What the hell? Uh, Mike, it's okay, relax, the other Mike Translow says. I'm here from another universe and I know how crazy that sounds since you and I are the same person. But how? The other smiles. There are parallels going on here. Geyer's ventured back and forth through time and caused the timeline to lose some of its integrity. He knows, he thinks he knows what he's doing. He thinks he's in control, but he's not. I want you to know something, Mike. I may be you, but I'm glad you're not me. The Mike from this universe leans against, this wall, against the wall to steady himself. Why? 
The other Mike pulls a flask from his jacket pocket and downs some nasty concoction, a mix of alcohol and flavoring not really fit for human consumption. In my reality, I'm general. I'm not Mike anymore. It happened when I lost Katie. In my universe, she was killed by Saval. That evil SOB shot her while I fought against his forces. I lost her. That's terrible. The other Mike nods. That's not the half of it. I became general, a man who was a leader and a military man in every sense of the word. I lost some of my humanity. The battle between Falteris and Ulta was brutal. I launched some really horrible attacks on them, Mike. I eventually was tired of their BS and launched a nuclear attack against the entire damn planet. The universe is, this universe is Mike tries to process that admission. Why? General Mike stands and looks out the window at the stars beyond. I want to have a really smart answer, Mike. I just don't. People suffered horribly, and then I was left trying to clean up a mess there and on my own planet since no one liked that decision. I just wanted it over. I went the wrong way about it due to my rage over Katie. General Mike then pulls a gun from his jacket pocket, the same one he had, had held the flask. He hands it over to the other version of himself. I was going to shoot myself in the head with that. I was going to just end it, and then I wound up in this universe and in this time. I was baffled by what happened and found out what the date was and that the timeline was different. But how did you get here? General smiles. We both know how very smart I am. I saw the Vindicator from a shuttle. I was aboard near Falteris. I then flew to the ship and managed to get on board thanks to the crew's general confusion and stress over this time travel thing. Besides, if anyone saw me, they'd assume I was you anyway. Well, you with alcoholism and severe depression. Mike, you have a chance here to create a destiny I never had. You could defeat Altil and save them all at the same time. Do you know how the attack in the past happened? Mike asks. The general version of Mike sighs. Jason Marcus was captured and enslaved by Geyer. Geyer made him do it. But that was the old version of this story. You weren't supposed to be here. You're changing the future. I never understood in my universe how important my role really was. I was so used to being me that I lost sight of it. I wanted so badly to advance my career that I lost sight of the, sight of the things that really mattered. Mike, my friend, never become me. Mike shakes hands with the other version of himself. In my universe, it'll be different. General then turns and exits Mike's quarters. Mike lets him leave, though he knows he, it might be, he might be of some use in the battle to come. He just doesn't want to overwhelm everyone with the fact this universe, this future, is very unstable and it appears realities are colliding with one another. There's no telling how far this goes or what else might happen from here. It's just another sign, sign that time may be running out to get home. So, to explain that scene, I was having the mic of this book meet the mic from when I wrote the books the first time around. Where he lost his wife and he got really, really dark and he never went by his first name. That wasn't a thing. And he was very militaristic, so he got tired of the battle with Altil, and he decided, I've got two choices here. Either this battle's just going to be bloody and prolonged forever, or I carry out a nuclear attack on the planet. Carried out a nuclear attack on the planet, turned the Altilians into a more um, sympathetic character in the book. Anytime there was Altilians in the book, they were the more sympathetic ones. And it was a storyline that... that I mean, I wrote it as a kid when I was about 13, and as I got older, I thought, you know, it's getting harder and harder for me to defend that a hero in the book did that. It's getting harder and harder to defend that the character of this, the best character in the book, did that. That's that's a terrible thing. So I thought I would do this kind of an echo version of that to acknowledge that I wrote that way back when and that it's a different character now than the one I wrote the first time. So just sort of a thing to do there. And General does show up again. So, because I thought it was a good idea to just throw him in here. Because you, you need a guy who's kind of kind of heartless at certain points during battle. And, yeah, I think I'll end it there for today. Because we're up to about 20 minutes. And we're getting up into battle territory here. We're up to page 309 out of... 342, which includes the epilogue, so 338. So about, about 30 pages left. Yeah, about 30 pages left.
I didn't like how I worded that though, because it made it sound like John ran into a version of another version of John, but it's Mike. So if I was rewriting that, I'd make that a little more clear that it's Mike we're following to his quarters and not John. John, who goes to the E215. And even reading that now, I'm like, wait a minute. I thought one of those ships gets blown up, but I know that can't be. So yeah, I'm, I'm even looking at it going, I don't remember. Anyways, uh, there you go. Um, thank you guys so much for your continued support. I wore my Star Wars shirt for, for this one tonight. Yvonne's almost got all the caps done. She'll be done those by tomorrow. There's about 10 more left, and then they're all done. That's not a thing. And, There's uh, so many left. And then, then it won't hurt her back anymore. Oh, and her back. shoulder. I know. It's this shoulder is really bad. We need new mattress, too. I know. Because I, I had to sleep with my shoulder on top of the pillow, and that seemed to help, but it didn't help my sleep. I know. So... My shoulder doesn't hurt today, but... Mine does. So, yeah. All right. <laughs> so there you go. Thank you guys so much for all your support, as always. And uh, we will do this again soon, because I, I do want to finish this book out and then get into... I, I might as well go into part four. I agree. And then part yes. five. Yes. So part four is vengeance and part five is violation and then i never did a part six because it's not really done in trilogies after like this first three they were kind of done as a trilogy but the other ones are just kind of standalones so yeah anyways thanks again for all your support and for getting this channel darn near thirteen thousand subscribers it's clawing its way it's getting closer and hopefully that happens sooner rather than later thanks again i will talk to you very soon